the board met in executive session and did this salute the flag at that time. This time we're up to roll call. Mrs. Beckman. Ms. Schaefer. Here. Mr. Salmon. Here. Mrs. White. Here. Space ourselves. Mrs. McEwen. Here. Mrs. Richmond. Yes, here. Mrs. Corn. Here. Mr. Markarian. Here. Mr. Syatt. Ms. Fox. Here. Mrs. Gray. Here. Madam President. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. This is a regular meeting of the Board of Education and was previously advertised. There are two times during the meeting for public comment. The first is for questions or public comment on agenda items. So if you have a question about anything listed in the agenda, this is the time. Later in the meeting, there is a public comment session for other comments or questions you may have on anything else. Right now, we're uh, up to the student representative report. Jimmy. Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry I wasn't able to be at the last meeting, so uh, happy new year. Um, almost a month late. Uh, I am now a second semester senior, which I think is Yay. pretty crazy to say. Time really does fly. Um, so the student government has started work on uh, Mr. Ridge, which is our annual senior, I don't really know how to describe it, show. Um, in April, we reached out to Ridge Productions to start coordinating on that. Um, outside of that, I would say, you know, most extracurriculars are pretty busy in the middle of January. And, uh, Forensics actually just held our uh, annual Ridge tournament, uh, which had, I think, something like 850 kids from five states here in this building and across uh, Cedar Hill and William Mennon over the weekend. I know my coach wanted to share uh, a thank you to the board and I guess I don't really see much of the administrations from the schools here, but to them as well for how, allowing that to be a possibility. Um, the uh, spring musical is still coming along, and the winter sports teams seem to be doing pretty well as well. Um, I was able to be at the uh, later school start times meetings just uh, like a couple of weeks ago for BT Connect, and this is far from a scientific study, but I will say that after watching those presentations, uh, I would conclude that a decent chunk of Ridge High School is sleep deprived. So that's just me sharing my student perspective on a lot of the findings that were presented there. And then lastly, uh, two small things that uh, people asked me to bring up and just get a little bit of feedback on. Uh, one person wondered if it was possible that we could have uh, more of the like outdoor areas at Ridge be utilized because they complain that there is a lack of sufficient vitamin D being inside all day and have like outdoor seating for lunch like there is at the middle school. And another person asked, I don't really know how feasible this is, that sometimes the buses tend to stop on main roads like Allen Road in the hills and clog up a lot of traffic unnecessarily. Um, so those are just two small things. But yeah, that was a laundry list of updates. Uh, like the the ones where neither side can pass through because because like uh, stop yeah 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 and they were like can we make the pickups <laughs> uh, they were like can we make the pickups like inside like the developments instead okay, of on yeah, the main road yeah okay. I like yeah is that like a Somerset County like busing I I don't really know but I do know that I would ask here yeah so. okay thanks no I. Uh, Part of that is the efficiency of the route to try to make the route have a shorter time. So if it has to go in and out of some of those cul-de-sacs, it's going to add time. And, and in some cases, they can't even get in there and turn around. So I just wasn't sure what you meant, but I got you. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. So we are up to the board presentation. The post-secondary report. Do 
want to use this? I do. <laughs> I'm a clicker. You're right. I think we're all right for this part. No, that's not going to work. I got one for Nick. All right. Yes. More? So welcome to the annual post-secondary score report for the class of 2019. We're excited to share with you information about how our students performed on standardized testing as well as our college admissions data. There's quite a lot of data and information here, so we're warning you. We're going to share a lot of information and it's meant for you to do the best you can to absorb it, but we will post it on the website in the morning um, for you to review in more depth. Um, our goal is certainly to summarize the highlights and provide some of, some of the analysis for you. Um, Data can tell a lot of different stories, as you all know, and um, I encourage you to think about what this data does mean, what it doesn't mean, and while it's always our goal to take this and learn and grow, um, we should celebrate the achievements that this data um, represents and the hard work of our students and our staff. By any measure, this is outstanding performance. Mrs. Smith is going to begin with part one. Good evening. So to kick us off, we will start off with the admission standardized testing. And so this section is divided basically into SAT, ACT, and SAT subject tests. So first, the key differences and similarities between the SAT and the ACT. You'll notice that they're pretty similar in and of itself, but with a few differences that you can see on the screen. You'll also note that the essay is optional for both of these tests, and generally speaking, students have the option of taking one or the other or both. Colleges will have their own preference that they may indicate for students, or a school may be test optional, which we're seeing more and more frequently within uh, the field. So the trends for students taking these tests at Ridge as compared to the rest of the state of New Jersey. You'll see that SAT, um, along with nationally, is an increased number uh, against ACT. And so for the longest time, ACT was the reigning queen, if you will. Um, as of last year and continuing with the trend this year, SAT has been um, the more frequently taken assessment for students. Mean scores, if you look at the mean scores for Ridge compared to New Jersey and National, you will see that for evidence-based reading and writing for SAT and for math, we are higher, again, both nationally and within the state. And you'll see that the chart is um, just above the graph of the same data. So our neighborhood districts, comparatively, Ridge ranks third in evidence-based reading and writing and fourth in math. And so you can see that on the chart there. We've highlighted for you, again, it's a lot of data, and so we've highlighted Ridge um, in green. But you can see the different scores. Also important to note is that the, score, the school profiles for each of these schools are not necessarily online and available to the public for the class of 2019. And so we've collected and included the scores that, um, the schools that we can find, but not everything is online yet. So ACT mean scores, we are up overall by 0.8, and we are also up in every category and higher in every category than the state average. We are higher than the state average by 2.8 points. And so you can see all of the data on the screen there, broken down by subject area, comparatively for each year, a graduating class. <coughs> you also note that the max score for ACT is a 36.
ACT benchmarks. So the benchmark is basically a minimum score that indicates your chance of earning a B or better in the class. And so the benchmark scores are to the right in the chart for each of the subjects. And then you can see the percentages of students who are meeting those college readiness benchmarks for all four of the testing areas at Ridge compared to the state of New Jersey. If you take a minute to look here, you'll notice that these benchmark percentages are lower across the board than in previous years. In terms of the composite score, so the average composite score for the ACT is a 20.9, and so compared to our neighborhood districts, you can see where Ridge falls in that set. We are tied for fifth place on the list but note that we are still well above the average, the national average ACT composite score, again, of 20.9. And then similarly to the other slide, not all schools have posted their school profile for class of 2019, and so we've included who we were able to find. The College Board in 2018 produced their concordance tables. And so <clears throat> I encourage everyone to go online. The hyperlink is here in the presentation when this is available as of tomorrow morning. Uh, but it basically breaks down for you if you were to compare the two different tests, even though they're using different metrics, what is an approximate comparison. And so if you were to have a composite ACT average of 20, that is approximately equivalent to a 1040 on the SAT. But again, the concordance table is going into much further detail, and so I encourage everyone to read the 2018 report. Okay. So now on to the SAT subject tests. <clears throat> so SAT subject tests are generally taken by students in AP courses, but not only. Certainly students in honors courses and other courses take them at Ridge. Um, some courses require SAT subject tests, others recommend them, and others don't um, request them at all. Students will generally select the subject test they would like to take unless a school or a program specifies what's required. Um, and we are providing a link to some guidance for you on the, um, the subject of subject tests. So here you see the number of test takers in each subject and the average score at Ridge compared to the average score nationally. And this is reported out for any of the tests where we had more than six students take the test. Um, you will see that we are above the national average in every subject. Um, but you know these number of test takers do fluctuate from year to year. Um, and obviously there are some that are not reported here due to the low number of students who took it. So you'll notice, this, so this is the scores for ELA and social studies, literature and US history. Um, the scores on these two tests increased this year. Um, but what's interesting to note is that in our curriculum, we are not aiming to align the majority of our courses to these subject tests. In, in ELA and US history, for example, US history is taught in 10th grade. Students may elect to take this subject test at any grade, so a lot of times it's after 10th or even 11th grade, and so in that case there might be a gap. Literature content is taught across all three grades. So depending on when the students take it, at the end of 10th grade, they may not have covered all of the literature. So there can be gaps, and yet we still you know, have really good scores. Math 1 and Math 2 are not aligned to a particular course, but you note that um, the scores in both of those, um, on both of those tests increased this year. And then these are the scores for science. And you'll note a slight decrease in bio, both bio tests, chem, and a slight increase in physics. On to test prep. Okay, so test preparation. There are a couple different ways that you can approach this. It really depends on your personal learning style of the student. Method test prep is a 
service that we that students can access through Naviance. And so should they pursue the method test prep um, opportunity, the students engage in either SAT or, SAT or ACT practice tests broken down by section. They're given uh, performance feedback and really just a practice opportunity. And so last school year, you'll note um, the second to last item there that 107 students logged on anywhere from two to 87 times per student. That totaled 652 logons, and the students answered um, almost 10,000 test prep questions. There were 102 hours of time on tasks that they completed as well. So it kind of gives you a picture of the usage of method test prep. And just so that you know, it is similar usage to the last school year. Khan Academy is also a popular um, test prep service that students can access as well. So considerations for you as we sort of wrap up this section of the presentation. We've <laughs> hyperlinked a few different articles for your own reading um, and really just considerations for these tests in general. And so as I said in the beginning of the presentation, more and more schools are moving towards this test optional um, practice. There are also self-reporting schools that are included um, it, within the self-report. The test scores themselves are self-reporting. And so um, it's just an interesting trend within the field and any of the counselors can speak to that as well. Um, within the last 12 months, um, some data points for you, within the last 12 months, 42 schools joined the list of test optional and total, there are over 1,000 schools that are <coughs> test optional. That being said, we'll move on to the next section of advanced placement exams. Okay, advanced placement courses, many of you are familiar with them, but they are equivalent, generally speaking, to an introductory, introductory college level course. We at Ridge offer 28 of the 38 available advanced placement courses um, in students from between grades 10 and 12. Students are scored on a scale of one to five. Three is considered passing. Most of our students you'll see in the data who are enroll in the course, the majority of them do take the exam. And most, 96%, earn a passing score. That number's pretty incredible. So when we get the data, um, which is uh, available to us in the late summer, early fall, we are looking at the data in terms of the number of students enrolled in each course. Students who are enrolled in the course, what percentage actually take the exam? And then the student achievement on each exam. So for participation, Looking at, so this is, an, I kind of broke this down for you and the tables will follow for each course, but I kind of wanted to highlight what might be considered um, some data that we can look at. Um, cut, cut off with <coughs> courses enrollment that either increased or decreased by 20 or more students. So you'll see that um, four of our 28 courses enrollment went up by more than 20 students. Um, computer Science A is relatively new, so it's very popular, and those enrollments have actually interestingly fluctuated. You'll see that on the chart in a minute, um, but it's typically very popular. Physics II um, was rewritten, and that seems to be increasing in popularity as well. And then seven courses showed a decline um, for varying reasons that we can certainly consider. Um, Anecdotally, some of the, the counselors reported that the class of 29, generally speaking, took fewer AP courses across the board. That might account for that. Um, some of these courses, like environmental science and psychology, uh, are typically taken by seniors, and so we have added some new electives over the last few years, especially in the sciences, like um, principles of biomed um, and medical interventions and human body systems that do have seniors in them, quite a few of the seniors that may in fact be pulling from these courses. Um, the rest of the courses though are within that range and so they're, they're pretty much flat. A little bit more interesting is to look at the percentage of the students in the course who then choose to take the exam. I broke it by 80%, it seemed to be an interesting cut place, but what you wanna consider is that we don't require students to take the exam in order for the AP designation to be uh, on their transcript or to earn the weighted AP credit. So 
the students in the courses on your right are taking the course, the exam following the completion of the course at a rate greater than 80% um, where they're not required to. So a recent study by the College Board listed some of the reasons students take AP courses and then the exam. The number one reason um, was to earn college credit, <laughs> um, followed by to increase their chances of getting into college, to build their skills that they would need in college, and to save money. Those were some of the top reasons um, cited. So we have, um, this is the five-year trend of the percentage of students enrolled in an AP course that took the um, exam, and it is uh, routinely high, and it increased just a little bit this year. So this is the data that follows that. So you can see the breakdown over five years of the column A in each year is the number of students enrolled in the course. Column B is the number of students um, who then took the exam. And so this is the data behind the summary that I just provided in each of the courses. In red, there are courses that we saw a decline that I listed, and in purple, those were the courses we saw in, uh, you know, an interesting increase. So in trying to think about why some of these may have declined, you'll notice that psychology declined by, uh, you know, 50 students or more, which I, I haven't seen um, in the five years, in, in the years that I've been here. So in thinking about the reasons, um, it's certainly something to ana analyze, and we, we can attribute it to other electives that are offered, perhaps. Um, we've expanded our offerings in psychology, but not in the, for this class. Um, so it, that, did, that is an interesting decline and one to take uh, note of in the coming years. So the AP Equity and Excellence score. This, this is a score that is intended to measure the student, uh, the amount of access students have to AP courses. Um, it's designed to encourage schools to provide access to students, at, you know, and provide more increasing access to them. So you'll see it lists the number of students who took at least one exam in 2019, and that's 589. So like I heard anecdotally that there's maybe a decline, this number is also less than it was last year in the class of 2018. It went down a little bit. It also then provides the percentage of students in each grade who earned a three or more or better on at least one of the exams that they took. So you'll see that the senior class, 53.6% of them earned at least one three. The junior class, 50.5% earned at least one three. And the sophomore class, 14.9% earned at least one three. Those numbers are consistent with previous year performance. And then lastly, they provide a summary of the graduating class, which shows that 60.7 of last year's graduating class earned at least a three or higher on at least one AP exam at any point during their high school career. 60.7% of all of the graduating seniors. So next is student achievement. Um, so I just wanted to highlight the list, the score breakdown of all of the exams given. There were 1,579 exams given at Ridge High School last year and well uh, over 50% earned a five on, that ex on their exam. Um, and you notice 96% or earned a three or better for a passing score. The five-year trend are also uh, similar in terms of the breakdown. This is the percent or the number, I'm sorry, of fives compared to fours and compared to threes over five years. And so you'll see we do have a very large number of fives um, each year and that's the total number of fives on all AP exams. So the next three slides break down the comparative data um, on each exam. So you see it shows for Ridge High School, the first two columns, the number of tests, tests that were taken in each subject, and then the mean score, followed by the same number for the state of New Jersey, and then globally. So when I co compile the data, um, there are 28 courses. 23 of the courses that we offer, our mean score is between a four and a five. Five courses, the mean score is between a 3.5 and a four, and we don't have any courses with a mean score below a 3.5. 
So when you look at the um, courses that are the most popular, I think the other interesting thing to look at are, you know, ELA, Lang, and Lit uh, globally. It's taken by um, 573,000 students or 380,000 students, and it sort of mirrors um, the numbers being great in New Jersey as well as in, at Ridge High School. Biology, chemistry, those are also very popular globally um, and at Ridge High School. I think U.S. history might be this, the next highest with 496,000 students taking that test globally. So the next series of slides, there's two slides for each department showing the, some of the AP trends we saw last year. First slide is showing you the number of test takers over the last five years in each course and then the percentage of the test takers who passed. So in ELA uh, last year, you, you note that our scores in both Lang, Lang is on the left and Lit is in the middle, uh, did increase from last year. And then we <coughs> offered a new, I'm sorry, the number of test takers um, increased quite a bit from last year. And the number, and then we have a new course that we offered last year, which is seminar. And we had 29 students enroll in the course and 20 of them, 28 of them took the test. Conversely, compared to what I just said, almost 100% of them passed most of the test. So the, the, the scores are very high across the board on all of those, um, those exams, including the new one, AP Seminar, where 93% of those students passed the test in its first year. Oh, I went the wrong way. It might be out of order. I think I went the wrong way. Right, so this is the breakdown of fives, fours, and threes on those same three exams. Note that we have the most fives in eight in AP Lang. In English, uh, in AP Lang versus AP Lit, um, more students take AP Lang in their junior year. Obviously, that's before they're um, applying to colleges, and that might be part of the reason. And then there are fewer students, uh, we've noticed over the years, taking AP Lit. Partially, we think because many college, most colleges will not take two English courses um, for credit, for college credit. So in mathematics, there are four courses, AB Calc, BC Calc, Statistics, and Computer Science. So I made a note of the fact that our um, test takers have fluctuated each year in computer science. Um, last year it was, it was up again to 105. You note that AP, AB Calc went down, interestingly, that's noteworthy, um, this year, where BC Calc went up slightly. We do have sometimes more students take the test than were enrolled in the course, particularly in BC Calc, because they're taking that on their own. Um, but you know, also note in the, in the chart below that the percentage of test takers passing is, is still quite high, nearly 100% in the three math courses, and computer science is a little bit lower, uh, may be attributed to it being a newer course, um, that has had some adjustments over the last few years. So the breakdown of fives, fours, and threes in those four courses, um, mostly fives in AB Calc and BC Calc, very high scores. Science. We have bio, chemistry, environmental science. Physics now has four different tests, physics one, physics two, and then physics three is a course um, for one, uh, one class where they can take two exams, Physics C-M and Physics C-E-N-M. And so um, some of the trends we see are changes in enrollments in Physics um, 1 to 2, potentially. And then you note, we, know, we do see a decline last year in the enrollments in environmental science. Went down from 74 to 43 students. Um, but when you look at the achievement of the students who took the test in environmental science, 93% of those students last year did pass that, that test. So here's the breakdown of fives, fours, and threes for science. Uh, physics one has a, a large number of fives. Environmental science, you see, has a lower number of fives. So environmental science is a course where we saw the uh, number of students go down the percentage of passing go up, but what we notice is, again, this is a course of seniors largely. Some of those seniors may be peeling off and taking some of our other science electives, um, but for a lot of the students in the course, they are, that may be their only AP course. Social studies. 
I think we offer all but one social studies AP exam. We have European history, government, and politics, human geography, both macro and microeconomics, psychology, and US history. So I mentioned we saw a decline in psychology. Um, and also, I would note that we changed the curriculum in the gov government and economics program. US government and politics used to be combined with macro, which is why in 2018 there were no AP test takers in macro. Um, and now this year, uh, last year and then going forward, macro and micro are now combined. And so you'll see there's about the same number of students who took that test last year um, on both macroeconomics and microeconomics. So that change is sort of reflected in those numbers. And um, you know, below you'll see that most of the students, uh, almost all of the students passed those exams. Breakdown of fives, fours, and threes, very large number of fives. European history has a very, is low enrolled, usually under 20, um, and it was a little bit lower last year. So world language, um, in Latin, that, test is, that exam is only given every other year, so we don't have any scores for last year. Um, we still report out on Japanese, even though we don't offer it anymore. And the Chinese scores you see are for students who are taking that exam on their own. Um, even at another district. Um, but you'll notice that the number of test takers went up quite a bit in Spanish um, and a little bit in Italian as well and a little bit uh, went down a little bit in French. We think those are mostly normal fluctuations, but of course um, they're doing a program evaluation in that area this year and they're going to look at those trends and see if there are any recommendations to be made. Um, but notice that there's a 100% passing rate in those exams. This is the breakdown of fives, the most in Spanish. And last but not least, we have fine arts. Uh, in this area, these classes are very uh, low enrolled. In Studio Art A, three, 2D and 3D, there's just a handful of students in those courses. They're very specialized. Um, and there are, you know, in the neighborhood of 20 who take Studio Art Drawing. Those numbers are up and down a little bit every year. Um, and so when you see a drop in like Studio Art 3D, it's based on just a very few students. It's not really the same as a 50% drop in another course. We don't even report out on the fives, fours, and threes in 2D and 3D because of the low number of students. This last chart just shows you overall which courses showed improvement and which courses um, had a decline in their passing rates. And so it's interesting to note that the Biggest increase was in environmental science, as I noted, and some of our physics courses. And where you see some decline in like a European history um, or even Calc AB, that can be attributed to being a smaller course. Um, but there's still also very, very slight decreases. So um, at the, at the um, risk of repeating myself, um, we have outstanding results on these AP exams, and it's, um, it's great to report out on them and celebrate the success of our students. Um, but it, you know, we do have highly enrolled AP courses. Um, we look at the trends to see what students are interested in taking, it's, but it's kind um, of an annual, especially in the sciences, we see uh, that we feel that the students are taking things that they're most interested in, and so the fluctuations are hard to attribute. Um, too fast to anything other than that. Most students pass. Um, we have very high percentage of fours and fives. And so some of our thinking, right, when we see that number and that percentage of uh, fives, fours, threes, does this mean that our identification process and our prerequisites are working and we're getting the right students in AP courses? Um, perhaps. Uh, does it also mean that maybe we have an opportunity to increase enrollments and, and allow uh, more access to AP courses to other students while also balancing our other desire not to add stress to students um, and thinking about taking AP courses or too many AP courses if they're not ready for them. Um, but that's kind of what the data, um, what we do with the data is what we try to think about is what, we, what should we do from here. Okay. Last but not least is the section on college admissions specifically for the class of 2019. So just keep in mind again that um, ever, all the data that we're sharing with you is of last school year for the class of 2019. So you'll see that we had 462 graduates, 96% of them continued their education, 91% to a four-year school, about five to a two-year school and other uh, it was 3%. So what is other? Other may be employment, military, unknown or undecided or taking a gap year. 
The class profiles, you can see on the screen what is the average GPA, average PSAT, average SAT, ACT. You'll note that the class size is higher in the class of 2019, but similar. The GPA is slightly lower than last year. PSAT, SAT average is higher, ACT similar. And apps submitted, that means the total applications that are submitted to colleges is higher by over 300 applications. The number of apps per student, therefore, is, is a bit higher at 7.8 compared to 7.2 last year. The percentage of those applications that are accepted remains about the same as last year. So the class of 2019 application trends. And so these are the trends of increased interest and decreased interest compared to the prior year. So of increased interest, Rutgers saw a spike. <laughs> can help yourself. The College of New Jersey. And then you'll see that some of the categories are tied. And so you'll see that Duke and Ithaca are tied, NJIT, Syracuse, and four other schools as well had an increase of about 12 applications. Decreased interest, Scranton, Clemson, University of Florida, and you'll see Colorado at Boulder and several other ties for eight less apps. So for context, I do just want to share that the total number of applications can still be high even if there's a decreased interest for that year. So take, for example, the University of Pittsburgh. There are still 51 applications that are going to that school, even though there are seven less. So similarly, the total number of applications um, on the increase list can actually be lesser than any of the um, number of apps on the decrease list but because of the spike in interest, that's why it's made the list. You can take, for example, Yale. There are 21 apps. If you look at Ithaca, 27 apps. That's still less than some of the schools like Villanova or, let's see what else, or Lehigh on the decrease list. So just keep that in mind as you're looking. So teacher letters of recommendation for the class of 2019, they asked 65 total teachers to write a total number of 689 letters. The range of letters per teacher was anywhere from one student to 57 students. You'll see that's a similar range as prior years. That equates to an average number of letters per teacher at 10.6. The graph below will show you that science was the department for the class of 2019 where the most amount of teachers were asked to write. Everything that you see here, just for context as you're looking at the numbers, these are the letters of recommendation. This is data that I pull from Naviance. And so any teachers that are writing for schools that are male only or teachers that don't have a Naviance account and they're writing a letter and mailing, mailing it in themselves, which is fine, um, that's not captured here. So just keep that in mind. College rep visits happening each fall. We hosted over about 100 schools. The number of kids that attended averaged out to um, about four schools per student. And the most attended visits, you'll see that the top two are in state and that the rest are out of state. Rutgers was number one for the most attended college rep visit. So our college comparisons. So everything that you see here for the percentage of Ridge applicants that were accepted, the breakdown here is based on selectivity. And so selectivity is determined here within Naviance on Barron's profile of American colleges. And so there are numerous different ranking systems, as many of you probably know, for determining selectivity. Um, but this, you know, in case you're interested in the schools within each category, you can look as a reference and resource at Barron's Profile of American Colleges. So it shows you that within each selectivity ranking, the percentage of Ridge applicants that were selected compared to the prior year. 
as you're looking at this, you're probably seeing that the numbers for this year are less than the class of 2018. So I want to remind you that the number of applications themselves was higher than the class of 2018. So as you increase your application volume, your selectivity naturally will decrease because you have more in the pool. So where do the kids go? So the top 10 colleges that the class of 2019 chose to attend, Rutgers, main campus, percentage of students you'll see at 12%. Rodin Valley Community College was second, University of Maryland College Park, and you'll see a host of um, out-of-state and in-state schools on this list. And I think it's important to note the percentage of students on the right, because as we're talking about the top 10 schools that um, the class of 2019 have attended, just keep in mind the overall percentage of students that that reflects. Compared to the class of 2018, Rutgers and RB were number one and number two respectively. Penn State and Maryland College Park switched places from the class of 2018. And there were also more ties in the top 10 than class of 2018. Overall, for the entire class of 2019, the number of schools that the 96% the of 462 seniors attended was 152 schools across the country in non-US. <coughs> so drilling into the Ivy League colleges, here you can see the number of initial apps, and I want to draw your attention to the fourth column in the net apps. So your initial apps is your initial interest, right? And so as your application process unfolds in the fall, the net app column reflects how many students actually applied. So for this set, as you're taking a look, there were 52 more net apps than the class of 2018 for the Ivies alone. So as we go back, let's see here. To the selectivity ranking that I was describing earlier, you'll see that the Ivy League row up top the drop from 2018 to 2019. Now keep in mind that the number of apps themselves increased for the class of 2019. More matriculation data for the class of 2019. So the, number, the percentages of students going to a four-year college was about at 91%, two-year 5.4, and you could see non-US college and other post-secondary some of the reporting categories that I mentioned earlier. And the chart on the right is matriculation by state. And so 25% of the class of 2019 attended a school in state. That number reflects actually 116 seniors. The tri-state area is within the top three, followed by the mid-Atlantic. So as you're looking at the percentages for the class of 2019, this chart reflects the schools where 10 or more actual students were attending. So you'll see that Connecticut is at the bottom with 10. So it's not necessarily a top 10 of where they're going, which state, but just 10 or more per state is reflected here. So in terms of overall trends, and just speaking to the field in general, the experiences of our school counselors, self-reporting trends continue, including self-reporting test scores, test optional trends are continuing, the average selectivity rate is decreasing while that overall volume and pool increases. Early decision and early action is becoming the name of the game, if you will. Therefore, weightless activity is increasing. 
There's also a higher prevalence that we're finding for our rich students of um, being interested in bridge or gateway programs. And so a number of different schools will have opportunities to get freshmen sometimes on campus and really in-house and taking either classes at a nearby community college or easing their way in and then starting officially as part of that freshman class in the spring. Some of those bridge or great gateway programs also will start students in the summer and then they officially enter in the fall. Some start abroad and then they officially enter um, on the state side. Colleges are continuing to focus on mental health, so that post-secondary level is continuing the same conversations that K through 12 secondary are having. There's the Ivy Collaborative, which each Ivy school takes on a different charge, if you will, to um, focus on a different aspect of mental health. And it's really, it's not restricted to, um, to Ivy League schools. It's a conversation in the field in general of education. And so there are a lot of schools doing a lot of good work at increasing the supports of mental health professionals on campus. So NACAC, the National Association of College Admissions Counseling, produces a state of the union, if you will. It's a state of admission every year. And so for the class of 2019, the college admissions report reflected and identified the top three um, factors that admissions offices look for, which were grades, high school curriculum, and test scores. So even as we're talking about an increase in test optional schools, there, it still remains one of the top three factors that admissions offices are looking at. So here, if you are a visual person, we have a Wordle. Um, so a uh, visual representation, credit to our uh, librarian, Dr. McNally, who uh, creates this for each of our graduating classes. So for the tw class of 2019, um, we have the Wordle, the visual of the colleges with highest attendance that I reported on earlier. So we thought we'd end this section with just um, kind of a, a little plug, if you will, for an upcoming program that we're having in March. So as you're digesting all of the data and information that we just shared with you, you know, how can you internalize this, take it back to your families, talk to you know, your kids and, and what might be, help you facilitate that conversation. That's what we're hoping to achieve with our program in March. And so we're titling it Academic Rigor and you know, which just asking the questions of all of this, looking at the trends and looking at um, the opportunities that are here in Burns Township and at Ridge, you know, what's right for me? And so even in the world of college admissions, we often talk about fit. And so what's the best fit for you? And the number of APs and um, which admissions tests you take could look differently for everybody, and that's okay. And so how do you determine and decide on your best fit? Uh, those are the guiding questions that we have for our upcoming program. And so uh, we are opening this up district-wide, not just uh, Ridge High School families. And so uh, we encourage those of you who can to join us on uh, March 12th. Questions? <laughs> I live, eat, and breathe this stuff. Um, questions, two. One, it sure looks like the AP statistics are heavily in the favor of our students getting threes, fours, and fives. Yes. You said at the end it was 90%. Yes. So what is this College Board AP Equity and Excellence score of 53? That doesn't make any sense to me. Of the total student population who, have act, who are taking it. So when we look at the passing rate, that's of the test takers. So the AP Equity and Excellence is looking at the percentage of students, well, the graduating seniors, it's for the entire senior class. Oh, so it's 53% of the entire senior class. Oh, okay. All right, that makes so more sense. So in other words, Good. Right. right, it's not just, because it's difficult to look at the numbers because some students are taking multiple tests. Right. Right, but so the AP Equity and Excellence is looking, like we had 593, I think it was, Yep. Separate students 89. who took a, an AP test. That's one thing. Okay. So that's a, a different way of looking at it, as Got well it. as the scores that go up. Okay. And the AP, as we all know, is increasingly expensive for families to um, pony up the money. And we have to do it earlier now than we used to. Does the district do anything to help support students who might not be able to pay for those tests? Um, you, you, there is always programs for students who are on 
free and reduced lunch program. That's, that's sort of in existence for any of our programs. We don't do anything more across the board for AP, like we don't pay a portion of the exam in any way, but, um, but certainly for students who are in the free and reduced lunch program, that's available to them. Is that what you meant? Yeah, and I did want to make a note of the change in registration. So for this year, students were required to register in the fall. Um, so we're certainly going to have our eye on to what impact that's going to have on the number of test takers um, this coming year. <laughs> well, you can ask your question. Go ahead. Why did we change it? We didn't change it. The college board changed it. And we can guess why they changed it. Um, a lot of seniors, if, if, you're, if you don't have to make the decision about taking the test until the winter, you may already have been accepted. So that's one possible reason. Uh, so I have a couple questions, but I have to ask for clarification. Sure. Um, with regard to the Rutgers applications of 192, or any of those on that slide, and then the percentages of how many students attended as a percent, it's a percentage of the graduating class, so 11.9% of the 462 attended Rutgers. Correct. So about, that's about 55 students from the 192. 61. Six, do the oh, math. okay. <laughs> so, my, okay, so I've, that was just for clarification. My question is about, and this is a long-standing concern that I have with the number of applications that students submit. Um, in many instances that I can cite personally with students that I know, they didn't get into the school they really, really wanted to go to where they would be a fit looking at Naviance because we have an excessive number of students applying who have no intention of going there because their friends are applying or because, well, what if nothing else works out, I'll just apply there too. So I'm curious about um, whether there are conversations that the counselors are having in aggregate with the class when you meet with them as a, you know, as a grade or individually or in any other opportunity that might exist for that? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, definitely our approach is to talk about the fit. And so I think it's also hard when you know, this is, it's, there's a lot of pressure with this time of their life um, and what they're going through in terms of just within each other, kind of comparing um, national trends. And so I think it's hard, but there's definitely a high volume of applications for sure. Um, and so on an individual level with a counselor, with a student, you know, they're definitely having conversations about the right fit. My next question is about something that I know we have great difficulty capturing, and it's a perennial question when this report comes around, and that is we don't have any data on students who matriculated and then transferred. And I, I know you, know you came from Virginia, maybe you have experience with whether there's a way to capture that data. I wish I did. <laughs> um, it is hard to capture. It's often voluntary to respond to inquiries from graduating students. And so um, the National Clearinghouse within Naviance captures some data. Um, ultimately, it's not available until the students after their freshman year, so you're often reporting out two years ago, right. and so two years out. So um, it is hard to capture, I think, um, on a pretty wide basis. But it would be helpful you know, to, to find methods, and it could be something that we look into doing that you know, and how people successfully do it in the future. It seems like the possibility may be within reach because of social media, where years ago that wasn't really even an option. Um, I just think that we are missing a significant piece because when you speak about fit, I know, I had one of my four children transfer. It, they don't know until they know, and that might be after they got there, and um, it would be helpful for classes to come. Hi. Hi. I, I, when you were, um, um, Mrs. Smith was talking about the reasons people were taking, it was the AP, was it? That was me. Oh, it was you? <laughs> it's okay. I couldn't remember who was saying the reasons they were taking it, like to the save money mm -hmm. or to, 
but I didn't hear like because I really really love it. <laughs> because it wasn't like, one of the top five responses. Um, but it was. It was not. No. One of the top um, like so to me, like in my mind, like the AP classes are really. I mean, originally were for students who excelled at this certain thing and and, and loved <laughs> the actual subject that they were that they were going to take. It was, it, it was a response, you know, just not one of the top five Okay, responses. just It was on there. Okay, because it just makes me nervous because sure. we have, like, the SEL. And that was a college board survey, not a Ridge High School survey, oh. just so you know. Okay, well, I'm not a big fan of the college board, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, because with the SEL implications sure. and talking mm -hmm. about APs and people not wanting a lot of homework, you know, and the stress, I just, it just seems like, I mean, our kids do great. And they do great because they have a lot of support. We have great teachers. We have, you know, great system. But I don't know. It just seems like when I ask kids if they're having fun, it's usually like, what? So it makes me nervous. So it just, That's why it's a you know, pushing an APs just to take APs seems silly. Just to, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think, not, not that you're doing it. I'm just saying that yeah. the, um, the whole, the culture, sure. not, the, not our school in general. I'm just saying the globally, globally yes. like the, the marketing of mm -hmm. it all is that you can't, get into college without it, and it's just not right. true. And that's what I wish well, that was well, more. That's part of the reason for this discussion. Yes, yes. and I think it's great. examples of students who have taken one AP course and gone to certain I mean, my kids took none, and they got into all their colleges. Right. Now, or, what, or one honors courses, or no honors courses. And um, also about, it would be great to have numbers of, about kids. A lot of our kids go to college, mm -hmm. but anecdotally, I can tell you a lot of people, kids come home as well, <laughs> just from living in the town and knowing in, in my own personal experience. And I like to see that RVCC is up there a little bit because I truly believe that lots of kids, even though they're, you're almost brainwashed to think that you have to go away and a lot of them really aren't ready. Mm -hmm. And the ex with the expense and just the maturity, that it's just such a, it's a good school and it's, it's disparaged, but it really shouldn't be, right? I'm glad to see that. Clearly a lot of students go. Yeah, they do, so it's a good thing to see and it's not, it's, it's good. It's like it's a good school, and it can get you into even in a better school. It just I don't you know. Right. It's just it's not us. Not because you're, it's just the mentality, you know. And the more you in the culture, and the more you see stuff like that, and people being successful doing that, I think it could change. A, you know, it has it trickles down, and it has a. I don't know when we all talk about the social emotional, it just has a lifts people up who are thinking, you know, I'm not good enough, but they are, you know. So that's just we agree. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Something launching. Something Do you hear that? Oh, it's the screen going up. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Countdown. Exactly. Yeah, it's just the screen. Okay. So for, for finance, you know, notice that we have one agenda item, so it's one to thirteen. Okay. For finance. Okay. Right there. It's cold up here. Sorry. Yeah, it's weird. Okay. So our next agenda item is the superintendent's report. I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm not quite ready. Okay, so we just have a couple items on the superintendent's report uh, this month. One is the 2020 uh, board committee assignments. Uh, you may recall I mentioned that we would be doing this uh, at this meeting. At the last meeting, we swore in our new board members uh, and elected our president and vice president. Uh, so as a next logical step, the uh, board president works with the board members and develops the board committee assignments for calendar year 2020. So that's the first item on the agenda. The second is just our monthly our, our board meeting here report.
Okay, so can I have a motion to um, approve the, those committee assignments? Mr. Salmon and Mrs. Korn. And a roll call, please. Mrs. Beckman. Yes. Ms. Schaefer. Yes. Mr. Salmon. Yes. Mrs. White. Yes. Mrs. Richmond. Yes. Mrs. Korn. Yes. Mrs. McCune. Yes. Mrs. Gray. Yes. Madam President. Thank you. So our next item is public comment. Um, when you approach the microphone, please state your name and address. Each statement made by a participant shall be limited to five minutes. Um, just remember that this is not a time for um, question and answer session, but a time to share your comments and thoughts. And if the opportunity presents itself, we may be able to address some of your comments or questions afterward. And this session is for agenda items only. And this session is ag for agenda items only. So we welcome anyone who would like to come up for public comment. Okay, seeing no one, uh, we'll move on to, sorry, uh, approval of minutes. Can I have a motion? Mrs. Schaefer, Ms. Schaefer, pardon me. And a second, Ms. Rich Mrs. Richmond. And a roll call, please. Mrs. Beckman? Yes. Ms. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. Salmon? Yes. Mrs. White? Yes. <coughs> Mrs. Richmond? Yes. Mrs. Korn? Yes. Mrs. McCune. I'm going to abstain because I wasn't here. Mrs. Gray. Yes. Madam President. Thank you. Our next item is the Finance Committee report. We have uh, items 1 through 13. There is an addendum. So are you going to give the report? Um, I, can, I can do the report. The minutes went out this afternoon, but um, if people have any follow-up questions, um, they can ask them later. I can go through most of it um, now. Do you want me to do it before we vote on the items? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Finance Committee met on Friday, and um, we had a Aramark facilities update where we heard a lot about staffing. Um, we have a lot of, um, we've had some turnover over the last year or so. We talked a lot about um, the process of how work orders get put in, and um, we had three um, people come to the meeting. We had, um, let me see where their names are here. The um, regional manager for Aramark came, um, Tina Genosa, and then we also had Bill Gerichter from Advocate and Kevin O'Reilly, who works for Aramark. He's their facilities director. Um, and they addressed some of these issues with the um, process of work orders. Um, they're going to bring some in to do an analysis also next week, right, Rod? This week. Oh, this is next week. <laughs> this week to analyze the system um, to try to also come up with some more improvements. Um, and the Aramark has also brought in an additional um, employee staff member to help get caught up on some of the backlog. And they'll be looking to see um, what the um, actual number of orders is and, and how that's going to be properly, you know, got caught up on as quickly as possible. Um, okay, then we talked about um, the Ridge um, Lacrosse Club's um, proposal for a lacrosse wall. If you remember, we, they had come to us a while ago with a proposal to put a wall um, for lacrosse practicing on the side of the um, track towards the school. And when they got their estimates for that proposal, it was more expensive than they were anticipating because of the, the hill and what would need to be dug out. So now they have proposed um, moving it to the other side over by um, Cedar Hill to the, um, I guess if you're facing Cedar Hill, to the right side of the visitor's bleachers. 
Um, they have not gotten an estimate yet, um, so they don't know what the cost of that would be, but they're asking us to approve the resolution, which is the addendum on the finance minutes, to allow them to um, get an estimate and bring it back to us. So the board would have to have approval for their plans should we decide to go forward with that. So we recommended that we go forward and let them come with the new location and get an estimate. Um, then we got an update on health benefits. Um, we have several more months of data since last time we got an update. And Mr. McLaughlin explained um, you know, the numbers. Um, we had a couple months that were a little higher than average and a couple that were down a little bit. Um, he, is budget, he is working on um, coming up with the best um, projections for budgeting as we go into budget season. Um, so that will be an ongoing discussion. Um, but we're expecting we had um, we're expecting a, a typical you know increase like we had this last year of a big increase which is what is typical in health insurance unfortunately. Um, then we talked just about the budget development in general. Um, besides the health benefits, we talked about trans transportation. Um, Mr. McLaughlin explained that he and Mr. Mercarian are working with Ed Services to try to come up with a potentially different way of. Um, of doing our contract with them to, um, we, we had switched to analyzing every single year. I'm not gonna explain this well, but um, having trying to, to look at each year's numbers to project for the next year, the actual costs, and it's very time consuming and difficult to get it all together before the next year. So you're looking at more of a multi-year um, proposal that they're discussing, but that's to be continued. Um, and we also talked about salaries um, and the tax levy and how um, we are having decreasing enrollment overall. And so we have to look very carefully at sectioning and um, staffing as we go forwards. And um, that will be part of the discussion of the budget development. Let's see. Um, we got an update about a meeting that Aramark Food Services had with the students at Ridge. Um, with Mr. Krauss and um, several of the Aramark um, chefs and the regional manager. Um, the students like a lot of the new food offerings and um, the issues with eighth period lunch seem to have Enough been resolved <laughs> where there wasn't for the students by eighth period. So I think that was positive feedback. And then we're up to the action items on tonight's agenda. Items one to four are standing items. Item five is professional development. Um, Item six is field trips. Item seven to 10 are services for students. Item 11 is a settlement, and item 12 is a contract with the Y for special education aquatics um, students um, to go there. And then the, item, the last item was the addendum, which I already mentioned about um, the lacrosse wall. Does anyone have any questions before we vote on those or about the report? I know some people might not have had the time to read the, the report, so if you have questions afterwards, um, we can follow up next month, next week, whenever it is, next meeting. No questions? So I apologize, I should have asked for a motion uh, before uh, we heard the report. Okay. So can I please have a motion? Uh, Mrs. Richmond and Mrs. Korn, for the second. Okay. And a roll call, please. Okay. Mrs. Beckman? Yes. Ms. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. Salmon? Yes. Mrs. White? Yes. Mrs. Richmond? Yes. Mrs. Korn? Yes. Mrs. McCune? Yes. Mrs. Gray? Yes. Madam President? Thank you. Our next agenda item is the Personnel Committee Report. Um, I have a very brief report, um, but first I'll mention that we have uh, personnel items, agenda items one through 18, I believe. Uh, so uh, would someone like to make a motion to thank Mrs. White and Mr. Salmon? So the personnel committee met on January 17th. Um, much of the conversation is not, um, you know, appropriate to share, but I will um, mention that Mr. Syatt shared a brief update on the permanent job opening for the Rich High School principal position. Uh, the posting for that opening closed at 11.59 p.m. on the evening of this meeting, and the candidate reviews uh, will be taking place now and through the 30th, and final candidate interviews are planned for early February. Any questions? 
Um, so could we have a roll call, please? Mrs. Beckman? Yes. Ms. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. Salmon? Yes. Mrs. White? Yes. Mrs. Richmond? Yes. Mrs. Korn? Yes. Mrs. McCune? Yes. Mrs. Gray? Yes. Madam President? Thank you. Uh, our next item is the policy committee report. Um, we haven't had a policy meeting, so there's no report. Okay, and our thank you. Next is next week, I think. No, February. Uh, what? February. <laughs> okay. So riveting, I can't wait to the next week. Uh, I think it's the 10th. I'm sure it'll be a good one. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, it's the 10th. The 10th. Okay, so um, if there's any you know, policies, we'll talk about Okay, so then the next item is the curriculum committee report, and I do actually have one. Um, this meeting was the, um, the meeting prior to the reorganization, so um, I was still the chair of that committee at that time. Uh, the committee met on January 3rd. Um, uh, well, do we? We don't have any items to, right? Do we have any? No. No, no we have no course approvals. Just the report. So um, there were a couple of course name changes in um, CP Biology and Enriched Biology, and they are currently um, in printed in or um, included in the program of studies for next year. Um, this has been reported several times, so I won't go back too far on that. Um, there was some information on the re revisions to option two. Um, Mr. Thompson has been working with the counselors to explore opportunities to streamline the process. In part, due to timing, the option two application process places considerable strain on the scheduling process. There'll be two primary changes to the option two process for athletics. The first one, uh, the application process for option two timeline is gonna be moved up. It is anticipated that having students express the intent to apply for option two at the front end of the schedule building process will help reduce the heavy burden of late summer changes to the already built schedule. The full application will still be due at the end of July as it was. Additionally, parents and students will be required to complete a policy sign-off form in Genesis that outlines the commitment and requirements of option two PE. The students will attend an option two PE orientation meeting at the start of the season or marking period. There will also be a video detailing the responsibilities of participating. All of these uh, changes are detailed in the program of studies, which is on the website. Um, the next topic was sol summer algebra. Uh, Mr. Colmer reviewed proposed changes to the existing summer algebra course within the larger framework of um, the WAMS two years accelerated math program. Um, the history of this, for the past several years, a summer algebra course has been offered to seventh grade students who did not qualify for grade seven algebra but wished to on-ramp onto the two year accelerated program which positions students to take AP calculus in junior year. Math 7 or accelerated Math 7 students wishing to sit for the test must earn a minimum of 15 points on the rubric. At completion of the course, all students must take the NJSLA Algebra 1 assessment. Students who earn an A in the summer course were eligible to move on to 8th grade geometry. When Mr. Comer met with the teachers to express, they, they expressed concerns about students taking a foundational math course in just seven weeks. The intensive seven-week course focuses more on skills-based content acquisition than problem-solving and application content acquisition. Um, during the time it's been offered, students have demonstrated varying levels of success. The feedback, the feedback was that this was less than ideal, uh, especially as they moved through the honors math sequence at Ridge High School. The overarching goal continues to be grow, growing competent math, mathematicians who demonstrate mastery of higher level skills. For students who do not qualify for grade seven algebra, also known as accelerated middle school algebra, Mr. Colmer and the teachers are recommending two new pathways to qualify for the two year sequence. The first is to take summer geometry, uh, a, a summer geometry course taught over seven weeks for incoming ninth graders. 
It would be open to Algebra 1 and acceler accelerated Algebra 1 eighth grade students looking to on-ramp to the two-year accelerated pathway. Similar criteria for the, uh, from the summer Algebra 1 rubric uh, would be used to qualify. The second option for students who did not qualify would be to double up on Honors Geometry and Honors Algebra 2 in ninth grade. This change is not going to impact the existing on-ramping pathway for accelerated math six students into Algebra 7. The next topic was uh, Grade 4 Accelerated Math. As part of the Gifted and Talented Enrichment Program review from 2018-19, the team has continued to review Accelerated Math 4. Grade 3 Accelerated Math was eliminated last year, and the committee is recommending the modification of Grade 4 Accelerated Math. Advanced Math 4 will be instituted as a weekly pullout program. Students will meet with the Quest teacher during their math class. The criteria for students to be placed in Accelerated Math 4 is um, criteria, uh, pardon me, COGAT uh, from second grade MAP spring um, test, uh, CPT5, which is part of the Quest identification process, their math report card indicators, and the NJSLA grade three. Rather than condensing content into less time, this approach will encourage higher order thinking. Mr. Colmer shared some examples um, of, the type of, of the type and the difference in depth of knowledge. And there were some links for the board members. To account for the um, change in grade four, accelerated math five will be rewritten to encompass grade five and grade six NJSLS. Accelerated math six will be closely monitored and adjusted as needed based on these changes. The last item, uh, teachers, uh, it's the teacher recommendation process. Teachers will be making course recommendations again this year like they did last year. The, they will be available through Genesis, Genesis prior to scheduling. Guidelines for the teacher recommendation process um, have been updated in the, pro, in the program of studies. Is that correct, Ms. Fox? Okay. Um, all teacher recommendations are non-binding and are intended to provide students and parents with teacher input, which is intended to assist students and parents in making the best scheduling decision. Teacher recommendations for elective courses are optional. Course recommendations for students with an IEP will occur at the IEP meetings and will not appear in Genesis. The teacher recommendations will not be vi visible on the parent portal until it is enabled by the district. The deadline for teachers to submit their recommendations um, varies by grade, and the teachers may include the comment with reservations um, as part of their recommendation, which means the teacher believes the student should consider the recommended courses, but they are maybe some reasons that it might not be advisable. Students are encouraged to discuss this directly with their teacher to better understand the teacher input. And the next meeting is February 7th. Did anyone have any questions? Okay. Okay, so then the next item is the ad, well, I guess we're gonna have to update our um, agendas since we don't specifically yeah. so have an advocacy <coughs> committee anymore. But do you have a report? I do. Okay. I do. Oh, we have a little crossover. I, and I explain. I'll, like I'll explain. You got it? Yeah, I got it. Um, all right. So um, we met with the William Annan Student Council uh, before we met as PTO presidents. Um, the students provided us with an overview of what they've done so far this school year. A few examples are that the students collected over 2,000 items for the Somerset Food Bank as well as they had lunch in December with the now current mayor, Mr. Baldessari. Uh, the student council explained how feedback is received from other students the first Friday of every month. They collect this information in the cafeteria and ask for both positive feedback as well as suggestions. Now keep in mind these are kids and their suggestions in middle school. So uh, the students would like to see improvements in the bathrooms such as locks that work and thicker ply toilet paper. Uh, it was explained toilet paper the district uses is environmentally friendly. Uh, a request for cultural food items in the cafeteria, eco-friendly straws, the ability to change seats during lunch, clocks that are broken in classrooms to be repaired, and the desire to have phones during study hall, um, all were suggested. Study hall was also a big topic on students' minds. They shared that recess rather than study hall is desired by some, 
as well as wanting study hall to take place outside during the spring. Some students would like a longer amount of time to get to study hall so as to have time to talk with friends in the hallway. Unfortunately, that's not possible because classes are taking place and students talking in the hallways would actually be a disruption to those classes. There's also an issue with media passes that is being looked into with the hopes of a resolution soon. Apparently, there is a limited number of media passes each morning and they're often distributed um, by the time some kids arrive at school. So there's not an equal opportunity to utilize the passes. In addition to working on this, the WAMS administrators are working on changing the system of where uh, seventh graders sit upon arrival to school so they too can choose their seats as other grades are able to in the morning. Lastly, a question was asked about the school colors and if it would be possible to have the same colors as Ridge so that the students could continue to wear their WAM spirit wear upon graduation. The students were very polite and quite serious in the manner in which they spoke to us and it's always a pleasure to have the opportunity to meet with the students. Um, following this, we then met with all the uh, PTO presidents. Um, we just quickly asked them to update us on to any meetings that have been scheduled uh, to make sure that we have Board of Ed representatives at the meetings. Um, in addition, we asked them to let us know any changes or any add-ons to dates so that they can be placed onto the master schedule of presentations for parents. Uh, we reviewed nonprofit requirements. Many uh, have 510C3 nonprofits in our district, such as school PTOs, the PEC, and many sports teams. We discussed annual reporting requirements, and it appears that there are some situations where organizations, specifically clubs, are using the student activities account at Ridge as their bank account. The student activity account is one account with many subgroups, for example, drama club, forensics, art club, individual sport teams as well. So this can be problematic. For example, at a sports banquet, often coaches are given a cash gift card. But as a coach is an employee, the gift card is actually compensation and should be taxed. The student activities account is a Board of Ed account, payroll. The student activity account is separate from the general budget, but both are Board of Ed accounts. Money over $600 is not allowed. That being said, uh, the Board of Ed will not manage a separate club account, but recommend that clubs have their own accounts as much as possible. Staff can receive gifts as long as it's considered minimal and reasonable. We discussed this to just raise awareness and PTO presidents will be discussing this issue with their individual boards. Um, Mr. Markarian then shared that there's a new vision for how the advocacy committee will run. When this committee began, it was created as a source of communication between the administration and PTO presidents, so information needed throughout the community could be pushed out to all. But over time, this need has changed. With individual school Friday folders, the superintendent's SOS each week, the Berners Township Connect Council, and Facebook, information has become much more accessible. With that in mind, the structure of these advocacy meetings is going to change. Going forward, Mr. Markarian will meet quarterly with PTO presidents, as well as building principals and a Board of Ed liaison as a superintendent's advisory council. It should be very helpful having all the principals at these meetings in terms of coordinating schedules, events, and discussing organizational issues. This year, the Board of Ed liaisons are myself and Robin. While we will be attending these meetings, this is no longer going to be considered a Board of Ed committee. The dates of the remaining meetings are March 2nd, May 4th, and June 6th. First, with the purpose of the June meeting to prepare for the, the coming school year. There will be a similar structure format to cycle through annually these meetings. For example, the first meeting may be for planning, the next the district accountant may give a presentation, the third meeting leadership for the coming year may be discussed, and lastly planning for the new year would be the fourth quarter topic. The new format still offers access to all members of the community. These quarterly meetings will still take place at 10 a.m. 
Many PTO presidents are also the representatives of their school on the Bernards Township Connect Council. And the remaining dates for those meetings are February 25th, March, no, April 28th at 3.45 to 5.15. The next, well this was the, the BT newsletter did come out, but it was informing us of when it w would be. And if you haven't had a chance to take a look at that, um, check your Friday folders because it was really wonderful. Um, and then uh, a question was asked um, about parent-teachers conferences. The feedback from all PTO presidents was that December uh, was not felt to be a good time to meet, as now that since elementary schools are on a trimester schedule, there wasn't a report card available yet. Conference days are always a topic of discussion each year, and lots of ideas were offered, and Mr. Markarian is going to be meeting with the principals to determine the approach for next year. Uh, lastly, how the missed day of Cedar Hill School due to the loss of power will be made up was questioned. Most likely the last day for staff in service, students at Cedar Hill only will come in for a half a day. The details including when the fifth grade clap out will take place will be finalized uh, with Mr. Simpola. Um, and lastly, I just want to point out that there are two um, presentations coming up on the 30th, which is this week, the, there's the next Parent Academy, Effective Learning Strategies and Habits. It's at Mount Prospect from 7 to 8.30. And then on February 5th, Effective School Solutions is doing presentation here on how to talk to your kids and survive. Thank you. Um, I just want to take the opportunity to reiterate what you just said about the Connect newsletter. It was amazing. Um, kudos to Ms. Smith and um, Ms. Fox. Um, hopefully everyone in the audience had a chance to see it. Um, and our next item is the Wellness Committee report. Um, so the committee met in December, right before the break. And we talked really briefly about um, Character Strong. So per um, last month's, well, it was now November's discussion, planning for, we talked about planning for training for January 6th, which is past. And um, they, they were gonna be planning for the in-service day, which is this Wednesday, it's just to remind everybody is a half day. Um, so after this training, the teachers and staff will start involving students slowly and deliberately. This program will involve peer leaders and there will be an update provided to the committee at the February uh, wellness committee meeting. Um, we talked about middle school looping. Um, for over a year, the staff and school counselors have been discussing the possibility of looping counselors, similar to the way counselors are assigned at Ridge High School. The team had, um, has discussed many challenges, including size of student body and impact of staff philosophy of SEL initiatives within the district, student needs for consistency and connection. The, st the staff has done research with other schools and explored more common connections, I mean, more common practices. Now that the population is starting to decrease within district, Mrs. Hudock and the staff feel confident about exploring this change. They are proposing assigning students to one counselor for their entirety of their three years at WAMS rather than changing counselors at each grade level. This change will, would make it more consistent with what's done at the elementary <coughs> school and the high school, providing students with the opportunity to create and maintain a relationship with one counselor for their entirety at WAMS. Mrs. Hudock and Mrs. Smith are working with the counselors to figure out how best to make this change. It doesn't come without its challenges. It will make participating in team meetings um, more difficult, but it's something they believe in making working and uh, making to work and um, wanting to explore. Um, we talked about the committee name change. As you will note on the agenda, it, um, SEL, the SEL ad hoc committee is no longer the ad hoc committee or the SEL committee. It is now the wellness to encompass, encompass the whole wellness um, philosophy that the, the administrators and um, district are, are really believe in and want to go forward with. Um, we talked about BT Connect. Um, the BT Connect, uh, I mean, the committee brainstormed some ways to make the meetings more available to the community. Um, as we know, the meetings are videotaped and posted on the website. We talked about live streaming that meeting, which we actually did on January 13th. We um, piloted live streaming, and I think it went relatively well. It was a pretty good success. So hopefully people had a chance to either um, watch the meeting, the videotape, read the presentation online, or 
see it live streamed. Um, and I guess the conversation will continue to see whether we want to continue doing that. There was a very quick um, little report or discussion about how honor roll wasn't um, appearing on report cards in Genesis and um, Mrs. Fox already took care of it and hopefully if you are were looking for the honor roll to be on a report card it is now there. Um, Ms. White will be reporting out. Um, they just met last um, week for the la next meeting and she'll be reporting out on that at the next meeting. Any questions? Okay, and um, does anyone have any liaison reports? Liaison. Okay, Municipal Alliance. Um, yeah, we, um, hold on a second. So, I met, we met on um, January 7th, I met with the um, Municipal Alliance, and it was they're very interesting, and um, I don't know if I got to go through all the minutes here, but then I wanted to bring up the, there's a couple of um, things, events coming up. One was Screenagers, that just happened, um, and we were here, um, and it was, oh, you can't hear? I'm sorry. Um, it was Screenagers, and it was here at the PAC, and it's, that's a movie. Um, it was on, on the 23rd, on Thursday, um, and it was a, uh, it's a follow-up to the other Screenagers, which is about screen time for teens uh, and tweens, and this one was more about mental health and um, what our kids really need as far as, far as mental health goes. Very, the woman who does it, she's a, she's a doctor, and it was just, it was really interesting. It was, um, and after the presentation, um, there was a, like a parent presentation by, um, I'm gonna, I hope I don't mess her name up, Olamide, Olamide hold on a second, um, Olamide um, Margarucci, um, and she's putting on a presentation called Not Just for the, for the Likes, and it's all about um, social media. And I mean, it's gonna be, it's a longer presentation. She just did a little snippet for us but it was um, interesting and it had a lot of good information, especially I think for um, younger parents. I mean, it could be for all parents, but just so you're aware of what's coming down the pike if you have kids in grammar school and younger middle school and um, all the dangers and that goes along with um, access to phones and social media. Um, at the presentation for screenagers, there was about, I don't know, about 100 something people there maybe. Um, although the, the pack, <laughs> the pack holds a lot of people. So even when you have a hundred people in here, you're like, oh, but it was good. They had 150 people had signed up, I think, or even more. Um, but it was a good, it was a good turnout. And most people stayed for the presentation afterwards, which I think, I don't have a date. I thought I had a date for that, but there's going to be, um, I think it was March too, but I can't remember the exact day. I apologize. I was looking for it, but I can't find it, but it's called not just for the likes and they're going to be posting about it. Um, I think it's um, going to be at the um, the at, uh, town hall. It's going to be a town hall, and um, I'm not sure which room. But I'm gonna, I'll look up. I'll, I'm going to. I was trying to find it. I couldn't find it. And also um, here at the pack, they're doing the fentanyl factor on um, here at um, March 31st, and um, they're part we're partnering with the Somerset Hills Municipal Alliance and the Safe Community Coalition to put that on. And that'll be here. Um, I think that was a, oh, they have the Twilight Challenge. That's Sunday, June 7th for anyone who wants to go run and support. Um, and let me see what else. This, oh, this seems like a, a year ago to me, so I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and I think that's about it. But um, there's a lot of good stuff that they're doing, and um, they're very excited, and I'm excited to be on a meeting with them and the liaison. So anyone have any questions or Comments? No? That's it. I tried to find the date, but I didn't easily find it. It's a, we'll, we'll get it. We have time till March. I'm sorry. It's a longer, it's like a two and a half hour presentation. She goes into a, a lot of detail about all kinds of like social media, everything about, like, the not just for like, so it's, but it, um, from what she showed, it was, it was very interesting, very informative for a lot of people. Does anyone have any questions for Mrs. Korn? Okay, so then our next 
item is public comment on non-agenda items. I'd like to invite anyone from the public who would like to come up to the microphone. Please remember to um, sign in with your name and address when you speak, when you address the board. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I think now you can hear me? Okay. Hi, I'm Maureen Rogers and uh, 21 Mount Airy Road in Biasking Ridge. Sorry, I'm nervous. Okay. Take a deep breath. Um, but I'm here tonight as a resident and also a teacher of biology in the district. Many of you know me or some of you know me. But I come to you tonight also uh, to talk and discuss some of my concerns over the proposed changes for the upcoming school year that will affect some of the incoming freshmen class of 2024. The proposed change is to take away a lab period from what is currently called our CP biology conceptual classes. The proposed name change as well to just, um, just college prep, but to take away the lab period. This change comes in response to the need to further differentiate or distinguish uh, between our conceptual and mathematical science classes. Currently, despite being different levels of college prep, mathematical and conceptual, they are still weighted the same at this moment, but they are again different levels and they serve different students. Several of our conceptual science teachers met back in the fall and agreed that a way to distinguish between the two levels would be to change the weighting of the classes instead of taking away the lab period. A different weighting already exists between our mathematical science, honors, and AP science classes at this moment. While it may be true to a certain extent that labs can still be accomplished in a 42 to 44 minute class period, the loss of, inst of instructional time will be dramatic. Dramatic enough to warrant major curriculum revisions Without a six period during the week, students will not have the opportunity to create and study models of biological processes. For example, I teach biology. Um, also, students in a science class without a layup period would lose the opportunity to collaborate, learn how to work with their peers, enhance or improve their problem solving skills, and um, read and follow a procedure, which is something that we work on from September all the way through June. Parents come to this district because of the stellar education that we offer all students. So there's no difference, um, excuse me, all students. And, and the strong record that we show um, is no different whether it's the AP students that we just heard in the presentation or servicing the students that are more of the conceptual level or the college prep conceptual level. Students that might require additional support. 
As a teacher of conceptual classes, there is no one who knows better that this group of students deserve not less time, but equal time, that, you know, equal in comparison to their peers. In addition, students should not be made to feel stigmatized when they talk to their peers about their science experience. They should not be made to feel as less than when they talk to their peers that they don't have or get a lab period. I ask that the board consider the adjustment to the weight of our, of our current levels so that we can continue to offer and keep in place our strong curriculum rather than, oh, okay, sure, rather than take away the full science experience from our college prep students. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment? Okay, seeing no one, I'll close public comment. I don't really have anything to say about that one. Not right now. Okay. Can, can, can I ask a question? You can Would ask you? a question, too. So, and I don't know, if maybe this is something that needs to be discussed in curriculum. Um, my understanding with the change with the, with the CP conceptual um, biology is that it was not dissimilar to CP forensic science or CP um, biomedical science where there are labs going on in those courses. They are CP courses. They're just embedded in the class meetings. Is that correct? I just wanted to make sure that was correct. And also CP environmental science. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I understood that correctly. Thank you. Sorry, I'm used to turning it off. Um, so we have board forum is the next item on the agenda. Jen, do you want to do you want to take it away? I know you're waiting. Okay. Well, I, I actually really wish we had a packed audience for this discussion because I always feel like any time you know, we get to these board forums and we, t we talk about things that are very important and very relevant and very informative, unfortunately, we have a small turnout. So my hope is that this is all being recorded and that everybody at home will go and watch this presentation to get this information. Um, and for those of you here, I don't know if you saw um, by the agendas, there's a handout um, about 13 things school board members wish people knew about them. And it's very, very informative because I think that there are, we, we listen to um, a lot of things that people bring forward to us or we see the letters that we get sent or we see comments that are posted on social media about why doesn't the board do this and why doesn't the board do that. And I think that there's a very real misconception about what we can and what we can't do. And this handout really very clearly outlines um, what decision making we can do and what, what is not in our control and, and the ethics um, and responsibilities and how we um, are advised to respond or handle situations. And it's not always just as simple as, well, we told you, why aren't you listening to us and why aren't you doing X, Y, and Z? Um, and it just, it's unfortunate because we all go through a great deal of training from governments to finance to special education. Um, and it, and each, each training we get, it, there's always that element of, this is what you can do, and this is what you can't do, and this is the, the, the division, and this is what the, the Board of Ed's responsibilities um, are, and this is what the administration's, and they are two very different roles. Um, and unfortunately, I, I wasn't even necessarily aware of it until I became a Board of Ed member and went through the training, but I think that 
this helps to explain a little bit so when people want to know, well, why aren't you doing that? Well, because that's not our role and that is not something that we can or are able to make decisions about or make changes about or respond to questions about. I mean, I think you just did a really good job of explaining why, you know, we, we've had this handout posted on our website, like under Board of Ed for quite a while, but I don't know how many people have ever clicked on it. We've tried to hand it out a couple times, I think, in the past. Um, I think some of the frustration is about the chain of command, which we all learn about when we get our training, and about how um, if there's a, a, a concern or a complaint, it has to go through the chain of command. It, does, it can't come straight to the Board of Ed or straight to the superintendent until it's gone through the chain of command for like a simple example would be if there's a concern about your student, you're supposed to go to the teacher first and then if that doesn't work out then you would go to perhaps, the, depending on the age of the student and the, the situation, to an administrator in the building or a um, curriculum supervisor in that content area. So a lot of times when we have people ask us questions or come to us with that stuff, we have to say you have to go through the chain of command and I know that frustrates people but we have to say that and that's how it has to work. So that's one, one of the points in here. Another point is that there's a lot of things that we aren't allowed to talk about, <laughs> as John, as Mr. Crute can tell us, as our board attorney, um, and it's in the code of ethics that we have to abide by. So there's a lot of things, obviously confidential things about students, about personnel things, things like that we can't respond to. So we can't discuss it. So sometimes we're at a game and we have to just tell people, I'm sorry, but I can't be in this conversation. I have to walk away. You know what I mean? If people are talking. So, you know, it's not that we don't want to listen to people. It's not that we don't care. So that's like the, one of the other points in here. Do you want to jump in? I don't remember what. I just want to say something for the audience about where this comes from. It's not authored by this Board of Education. It's from the New Jersey School Leader, which is a publication from the New Jersey School Boards Association, which for lack of a better description is like the governing body for school boards throughout the state of New Jersey. So this applies everywhere. Can I? Oh, go ahead. No, I, I, one of my comments and I, my thoughts was that I think too when we're sitting up here and people are reporting or taking votes or whatever, we do a lot of work behind the scenes and, and not, it's not, we read all the reports. We have to do work before we get here. So when we're actually voting on things, it's not that we aren't listening to the discussion or having discussion, it's that we've already read them and we're not, you know, we don't have to process. If we had to do everything that we do in committees here, it would be impossible. So we have committees report out and that's exactly what we're voting on. Um, and I, <clears throat> I also like to say that um, being a parent in town and having lots of relatives in town um, and having four children in town and my husband and my brother-in-law and my sister-in-laws and my sister, when people post things online that everyone has access to, it's embarrassing to me when they're saying things that are really, that if my children posted them, I would have to punish my children to, <laughs> to, for saying something like that online. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's not appropriate. And it's, and it's not like we're up here, and I can talk to myself personally, I don't wanna talk for everybody, but when I'm not up here out to get anyone or not, out, not to not listen or try to do, make bad decisions for kids. My kids go to the schools. So um, we're trying to listen to everybody and do what's best for everyone. And unfortunately, sometimes not everyone agrees, but not agreeing doesn't mean that you have to say something really nasty because you don't agree. I'm happy to talk to anyone. I'm happy to discuss, have a discussion, but just posting stuff where we can't even respond if we wanted to um, or say anything is just, it just seems, I mean, it happens, but it doesn't seem right, especially since we do this for free, number one, and, and you know, and I, I don't want my kids reading that. I'm not, not saying my kids, but it's on, on, on uh, sites that all parents go to from the school. And my kids are in the school, and, and I have other people who know me that are reading these, and, and that's not right. It's just not right, and, I, and I, I just wanted to put that out there, and maybe people can think twice before they, decide to let their fingers fly when they're angry. And it's like the rule when you have like sports, you know, give it the 24, 48 hour rule and things would go much, it would be much more civil that way. And then, then I, don't have, I don't have my hackles up, I don't feel attacked. 
it, it personally almost, then it works better for everybody, I think, because having a civil discussion is different than a one-way bashing on social media. I mean, I do think that because people um, often, I guess, express themselves on social media, like when I first came on the board 10 years ago, I got a lot more phone calls, you know, and emails to me as a board member, and I was always willing to talk to people. I think, you know, now people are less likely to pick up the phone and call someone, you know what I mean, than they used to be, and, and that's unfortunate, because I think all the board members are willing to talk to anyone at any time, and, and if it's something does come up that we're not supposed to talk about, we'll just say, we can't talk, or we can't respond to that, or we can't listen to that specific thing, but we'll listen to your general concerns, obviously, at any time. So, we, you know, I wish more people would come to board meetings and write to the board and pick up the phone, but. Um. I just want to point out what number seven is because I think this was the most common misunderstood um, number for me, like when I was just a member in the audience. And I, I sat out there and I'd come and I'd speak at the microphone for you, like way before Mr. Mark Heron was ever sitting here. And I had the same feeling I'm sure many people have, which is, why is nobody answering me? And number seven, it says very clearly, and remember this is, you know, at school board meetings, the public comment period is for the members of the public to comment, not engage in a discussion with board members. And I'm, I remember that frustration of, I've just said this really important thing, and I've asked this really important question, and you're all just looking at me, like, <laughs> are you hearing me? And I, I didn't know that that, well, that's because, these public meetings, it's, you know, it's not, it's not a give and take conversation. Whereas when we have like the Burners Connect meetings now that we have, those are give and take. There are different, I don't know if regulation, but what's allowed is different. And if you're, if you're just a parent sitting there and you're not familiar with how, what the rules are that govern a board of ed, you don't get that. And you sit there and you're, you know, you get angry, and I, and I got angry, and you know, I now have the privilege of being on the other side and, and getting it, but I remember that feeling of, okay, I'm going home and I don't have an answer to my questions and I don't know if you heard what I said. Um, thank you to both of you. I was thinking very much the same thing that Mrs. McCune was thinking about um, on the other side, as she said, she's been on the board for over 10 years now, and I was in the audience for a lot of those early years of her time on the board, and I did call her, and I called other board members, <laughs> and, and they didn't always like what I had to say, <laughs> but they were gracious to take my phone calls, and I remember exactly what Mrs. White just said about sitting in the audience, coming up to public comment, and it was blank stares. And, and to Mr. Markarian's credit, I will say that he actually responds to public comments sometimes if he has information available right then and there, which is really nice, um, as opposed to having to wait to hear it in a later, you know, a different format later. Um, so I think overall what, what Mrs. McEwen said, I think all of us are open to the public reaching out to us to have meaningful conversation and I, I know some of you out there do reach out and we appreciate that because we re really appreciate the opportunity to share what we can about what's going on and how things work and, and again what we can or cannot speak to or um, you know have decision making power over. Can I just piggyback, though, on one thing that Mrs. Corn said? And I just want to be very clear, because it's come up in other meetings, uh, that you know, if you're on the Board of Ed, you should have thick skin. And that's not what Mrs. Corn is talking about. We all have thick skin. And you can post and say what you want about us. It's not going to hurt our feelings. It's part of the job. But what she's trying to point out is that we all have children in this district. And yes, should they be looking at Basking Ridge Moms? No, but the reality is people talk, kids talk, kids are cruel. I do have a middle schooler, I have a young one who I, you know, now say, don't listen. If somebody says, I'm fine, I can handle it. But you have to keep in mind that when nasty comments are made, 
it can trickle to our children. And that's not okay, because our children shouldn't have to have thick skins because of what our job is. And you would feel the same way if somebody went on and bashed your husband who was an attorney and said something nasty about your husband who was a doctor or said something nasty about your, you know, your, your business, which is why in a lot of these Facebook groups, there is a rule that you can't say negative things. It's the same thing. If you want to email us what you think, go ahead. But just, I urge you to keep that in mind because we do all have children in this school. And I guess along that same line with um, the rules that a lot of the sites have about not bashing local businesses, I would think that the same rule should apply for employees that work in the district too. You know what I mean? So I think it's something to keep in mind. Teachers and employees in the district I mean, I don't know why it would be any different. It was, it's not what legitimate concerns um, I'm worried about. It's other things that are said in, you know, as it snowballs. It's not like, hey, you know, this is, come to a meeting, we're talking about this, this is important for everybody. I'm talking about, like, saying something about board members that you just shouldn't say. Or teachers, or yeah. Whatever, I mean. So just in summary, I'm going to say thank you to the members of the public who came out tonight. We love to see people in the audience. It's actually awesome. And we love it if you share what you hear and learn, good, bad, or indifferent, with the people that you know, because it just helps spread information that I think is hopefully valuable to community members and members of the school, the larger school community. Does anybody have anything else for Board Forum? Okay, so then would someone like to make a motion for adjournment? Um, Mrs. Beckman and Mr. Salmon. All in favor?